This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used, for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in this large chapter on distillation and rectification. And today we would like to discuss some general considerations with respect to the mekep diagram. Well, let me first of all repeat how that diagram is actually being constructed after we have seen in the last um, series of videos the stepwise development with the help of the operating lines the intersection line and well possibly that were many parts so to speak and I would like to show how they really work together. I've shown that already in the end of the last video but this video I would like to approach really the, 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 the plotting that diagram starting out with the questions that you usually have if you want to design distillation column. So what is actually the starting point? Usually you have a certain number of variables that are specified. So what is usually specified? What has to be specified? Well of course you first of all have to specify the feed. You, you have to know what is what you want to separate, the flow rate, the concentration and the thermal state of that feed that you want to separate. So you have to know f dot x f i and you have to know q if you want to be able to design a distillation column. Without knowing that you don't know what to separate and that way you would not be able to design a distillation column. On the other hand side there are apparently other um, well variables that can be specified uh, but which of them are specified depends on the problem that you want to solve, how or which way around the problem is actually being posed. And what is usually specified is two out of four variables and the four variables are on the one hand side the compositions. It's xdi and xbi and the flow rates d dot and b dot. Two out of these four variables have to be specified as well. Without having two specified, you would not be able to perform a design. Why? Well, the easiest thing is, of course, if the two mole fractions are specified, because then you have all the mole fractions, you have the Q, and that allows you already to plot the McCabe-Tele diagram. You would not need the flow rates. But of course, for a quantitative design of an equipment, you would need the flow rates anyway. So you have to be able to calculate them. We will see in a moment how that works. So either the two compositions are specified. Usually at least one of these compositions is indeed specified because that's your purity specification. Yeah? How pure do you want to get with at least one of the flow rates? Purity can refer to some product that you want to have in the end, a positive uh, outcome, so to speak. Say in the water alcohol distillation you want to have an alcohol purity close to, well, alcohol is special because it has an azeotrope, so possibly you want to have a composition close to the azeotrope. So that would be specifying the XD. On the other hand side you might want to specify the concentration in the bottom product because that's your waste. Also for the alcohol product production Possibly you want to specify that you don't want to lose more than a certain fraction of alcohol with the bottom product and that means you also specify XB. So you can, there are reasons why you want to specify compositions. There may be other reasons that possibly you want to specify the distillate flow rate, for example. Of course, for all of these variables there exists a certain range which is feasible and I will show you in a moment how one can use the balances to solve for the other two variables that are not specified. And if you choose, for example, a flow rate beyond the feasible range, then, of course, you would wind up with well, unreasonable numbers for 
uh, uh, for one of the variables as soon as you try to solve them. For example, if the d dot would have been specified too high, b dot would perhaps turn out to be negative. And then you know, oh, I made, did, did some mistake. I was too ambitious with my uh, demands that I have for d dot and xd, for example, and then b dot is negative. Yeah, you cannot get more product with the composition, then you have entered of that component via the feed, and so you would wind up with strange results. Well, I mentioned already that, of course, we now need to specify the other variables. Uh, so we have two out of these. It can be xd and d dot, for example. And possibly you want to obtain the remaining variables, because you need, of course, all three compositions. So if you only know xd and d dot, then you can, of course, obtain xb and b dot via balances. And the balances that you want to solve are, for example, well, not for example, they are always those for the entire balance, where we know that we operate the column in steady state, that is, we know zero equals. What is entering is f dot, what is leaving is b dot minus d dot. And the same, of course, for component i, zero equals f dot xfi minus b dot xbi minus d dot xdi. And if, for example, the uh, xd and the d dot are specified, you can solve that, of course, because then you know, for example, f dot and d dot, and you can obtain b dot from solving this equation. So if, for example, the x, d, i, and the d dot are specified, then you can obtain b dot from the above equation, and it is just f dot minus d dot. And of course, if you want to, uh, you can now plug this into this equation and then solve for the x, b. How does that work? Well, if we plug in the b dot, we obtain 0 equals f dot x, f, i minus f dot x b i plus d dot x b i minus d dot x d i. And in here we have only variables that we know. We know the f dot, we know the x f, we know the d dot, we know the x d, and the single variable that we do not yet know, which is the x b. So we can solve this for the x b, and if we do that, we obtain the following x b i equals f dot x f i minus d dot x d i epsilon x d i divided by well the two other ones which is um, f dot minus d dot So if we know xd and d dot, we can obtain b dot and xb from solving the overall balances for the overall flow rates and for the flow rate of component i. And of course, you can use these two balances, these two balances, whenever you have given any of these variables to find out, any two of these variables to find out the two other variables, because then you have two unknowns, two equations, and of course, since all these variables are obtained in these two equations, you are able to obtain the other two equations that are uh, two variables that are missing. Okay, so you know in the end from, the, from what is given on the one hand side and from solving the balances, you know in the end all four of these variables. Now something else has to be assumed in order to be able to plot the mccab diagram. You know that actually. Uh, what also has to be specified is the reflux ratio. And here I expi explicitly write that we need to choose that. So you choose the reflux ratio, V. If you know that, you are able to plot the mccab diagram. And I would again try to repeat how that really works. So in the end, we know essentially all compositions, xd, xb, xf. We know the reflux ratio, we have just chosen it, and we know, of course, the thermal state of the feed, that is, in effect, we know Q. And with that, as I have shown already previously, we are able to plot the mccab diagram. How does it look like? Well, we have a diagram like this, more or less squared, of course, if I 
plot it by hand, it may not really exactly be squared, but sort of. We have also the diagonal, and that is a straight line, of course. Then we have the equilibrium curve that also has to be specified. If you don't know which system you want to distill, you are lost anyway. So you have to know the thermodynamic information somehow about the vapor-liquid equilibrium. That can either be experimental data, it can be some model that you have available to calculate this y over x curve. And of course, you may remind me that, as in any exam, I should also label the axis. So this is x and y. Both run from 0 to 1. And now this looks fine so far. So, this blue line is now the equilibrium. We now know now, either because they are given or because we have, have obtained them from the balances, we know now all compositions. Okay, so we know Xb, we know Xf, and we know xd. And of course xf should be lying somewhere between xb and xd, otherwise it doesn't work. You can prove from the balances if you like. And we know that we th need at these three compositions points on the diagonal. So we can always directly plot the vertical lines above these compositions up to the diagonal. If we do that, we obtain these three intersection points with the diagonal here, here, and here. And since now also the reflux ratio is specified, we can already plot the rectifying line. If the reflux ratio is specified, we can determine our xd divided by v plus 1, which is point on the y-axis at that coordinate, xd divided by v plus 1, and then we can connect this point with that, with that point, because we know that these are the two prominent points which we use to plot or to determine the rectifying line. They are both points that have to lie on the rectifying line, so the rectifying line has to is a straight line connecting these two points. So this should be a straight line as well. This is our rectifying line. The next line we want to plot is the intersection line or the Q-line and we know that of course the one point of that is at, X, X, at XF on the diagonal, so it is this point, this is one point of the Q-line and the second point is to be found on the X-axis at XF divided by Q, Q characterizing the thermal state of the feed. And we know that if the um, feed is boiling liquid, that intersection is exactly at xf. If it is subcooled liquid, it is lying somewhere over here, uh, q being larger than unity. Uh, if we have a two-phase uh, feed, then it's somewhere lying to the right. If it is the um, feed at uh, vapor, at dew point, then we know that it's at the intersection is at infinity, which means that we have a horizontal q line through this intersection point. And if our feed is superheated vapor, then we know that that intersection is somewhere in the negative because the Q is negative in that case. So let's assume that we have some typical case. Let's assume that we have a two-phase feed, which may happen quite frequently actually. So we have our XF divided by Q possibly somewhere over here. So this is our xf divided by q. That's one of the points of the intersection line. This is the second point. We have just to connect these two points with a straight line. If we do so, what happens? Well, we get a line like that. And that intersects now with the rectifying line. So this line, the q line, defines all possible intersections between stripping and rectifying line. For the given feed, all the intersection points have to lie on this straight line. Now we have already specified one rectifying line, which is this one. And since this rectifying line intersects with the intersection line at this point, this point also has to be one point of the stripping line. So this 
specific rectifying line, so to speak, selects among all possible intersection points exactly this one. So this is the point for the intersection with the stripping line. So we have to run through this point and that point to plot our stripping line. And we can plot it now quite easily. We can start out from here, for example, and plot it like this. And this is then our stripping line. Of course, it's a line infinitely extended, positive in the positive and negative direction, and both directions are sometimes required, so I plot them. And now we can start with our step construction between the equilibrium curve and the operating lines. And well, at first sight, that may, may look a little bit uh, complicated, but actually it's quite easy. Before I plot that, I should first, of course, label everything. Um, this is the Q line. And this up here is the stripping line. And now we can plot the step construction. It's easy because there's only one way to do it. Well, actually, there are two ways to do it. You can start either at xd and plot in this way, and you always plot between operating line and equilibrium curve. So you plot in this direction. You may have the idea to start vertically in the beginning, but then you realize that you are lost somewhere up here in this corner, and that doesn't make sense. So that is strange. There's really only one real possibility that you can take. So you can start out from here and plot in this direction. The other option that you have in principle, and depending on the question and or the, the way the question actually is asked, it may sometimes be wise to start at the bottom. You can, of course, st start at the bottom as well. Then you start at XB, and you first here you start vertically. If you start first horizontally, you would again wind up in the corner of the diagram, which is not sensible at, at all. So you would start out vertically here, and then a step between the operating line and the equilibrium curve. You only have to keep track on which operating line are you actually working at that moment, but we will just discuss that in a moment anyway. So let's start at the top, and if we plot, we plot vertically from xd, uh, horizontally, then we plot vertically, then we plot horizontally again, vertically, and so on. And then we realize at a certain point, we are passing the intersection between the two operating lines. And now the question is, of course, how should we proceed? Should we still proceed on the rectifying line or not? And as I, as I have discussed briefly already, of course, you want to maximize the concentration progress per theoretical stage if you want to minimize the equipment effort that you need, the number of theoretical stages in turn, which means that you want to maximize the concentration progress. And of course, the concentration progress here, if you would only go to the rectifying line, is just up to here, but it's larger if you go down here to the uh, stripping line at that point. That is, if you want to design a new column and you want to find an optimal situation, then you want to switch at this point where you pass the intersection point from one operating line to the other. If you start from the top, you are first with the rectifying line and then switch to the stripping line. Of course, the other way around if you start at the bottom. Okay, then you continue horizontally. Vertically, we switch the operating line, so we have to go to the stripping line. And like this. And now we can count the number of theoretical stages that are needed to uh, solve our separation task. And each step corresponds to one theoretical stage. And I've discussed that. Either you regard an equilibrium stage, uh, the equilibrium as characteristic for the stage, or you can say a theoretical stage is between those two points characterized by operating lines that refer to just the two streams meeting above and below the theoretical stage, because that's what's connected via the operating lines, always the flow rates meeting in between two theoretical stages. And of course, this is such a point, that is such a point, and that as well. So this entire step, so to speak, corresponds to one theoretical stage. And so you can count now one, two, three, four, and you realize actually if you would have five theoretical stages, we would obtain a bottom purity which is higher than required. Well, the, the safety factor you want to end, add only once and only 
at the end, you will see how really now the theoretical stages translate into real amount of equipment that we need later. And actually only after that you want to add a certain safety factor uh, to be sure that your requirements are really met. Um, but you only want to do it once. So before that you want to stay exact. And if you want to stay exact, you want to estimate the number of theoretical stages that are really required to obtain the purity XB. And of course, if you would have five theoretical stages, you would already be beyond that purity. So you want to estimate how many theoretical stages are required in order to reach exactly XB. And at that point, you may guess more or less, you may estimate a fractional value. It's permissible to use a fractional value because we are discussing theoretical constructs, theoretical stages anyway. So no reason to stick with integer values. On the one hand side, on the other hand side, you can estimate roughly because graphical methods have a certain uncertainty anyway. And because of that, you add a safety factor in the end, but as I mentioned, just only at the end. So here you may guess that you have a number of theoretical stages required for your separation, which is roughly 4.9. Okay, so 4.9 theoretical stages are required for that separation that is specified here. And with that you are essentially set and are able to describe the uh, entire process in the McCaftile diagram and you realize that for each theoretical stage you have one of these steps between the equilibrium curve and the corresponding operating line. With that I hope that I have shown that it is not too complicated to plot that diagram. Actually it is quite straightforward. You start out with your three compositions. You plot the three intersections with the diagonal and the vertical lines above the three compositions that are specified, the incoming and outgoing compositions. You make a certain assumption for your reflux ratio and uh, you choose it at the beginning. We will discuss the optimal choice a little later. And uh, thus you are able to determine the intersection with the y-axis, xd divided by v plus 1. You determine your intersection of the Q-line with the uh, x-axis at xf over Q. And then you are able to plot the rectifying line, you are, plot, you are able to plot the intersection line, and then you have your two points for the stripping line at xp on the diagonal and the intersection between the, stripping, uh, the rectifying line and the intersection line. Of course, sometimes things are a little bit different, possibly other things are specified, so for some other um, conditions, it may be possible that everything has to be specified the other way around. Uh, then you might start that same thing from the bottom. But that requires, of course, that you know something about the internal flow rates in the stripping section. Because if you remember, the slope was depending on the bottom flow rate and the L dot prime. So you have to know something about that if you want to construct that slope. But sometimes in real life, questions are asked the weird way wrong around, so possibly uh, that would be required. And you know from the equations that you have available also the slopes, of course, of the rectifying and the stripping line as well as of the Q-line, so you are able to answer any of these questions. Yeah? Which way around the question is asked, you only have to sort out which way you can tackle the problem and solve it. And sometimes you even have to solve things iteratively if one composition is actually being asked and you don't know, uh, then you can sometimes also uh, answer the question iteratively the other way, uh, the, 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 another way around. For example, sometimes uh, a column is specified, you have it there, it's a multi-purpose equipment, it has 10 theoretical stages. What are the purities that you can achieve? You don't know. And if you could do it with the construction this way, the Mercaptila construction, the step construction, then you wind up with a certain number, it's not 10. That's not the solution to that answer to that question, not the answer to that question. So you would have to optimize xd and xb until you finally reach these ten theoretical stages, apparently, and that means some iterative construction in that case. Usually, also that is not required to an arbitrary accuracy. It is tedious, possibly it takes you an hour or so, but actually, if you know how to plot that, it's easy to plot that. It's five minutes or so you got a full plot of this diagram with all the variables that you, that, you, that you need, so it's not so complicated, even if you'd have to do some iterations, and in the end you don't want to be uh, uh, too exact with such a graphical method. 
Okay, having spelled this out, I think only one thing remains to be said to that diagram. Of course, you can specify also the feed stage now in this optimal design case. And here we see that we have the intersection here. We say that we switch from the rectifying to the stripping section under these optimal conditions. Somewhere over here, we can say that the feed stage in that case, the optimal feed stage is 2.5. So we can say that this NF equals 2.5. And that's the last thing, more or less, that we can read from that uh, diagram that we can evaluate. And we will discuss the details, the variabilities of the feed stage, as well as the possible choices of the reflux ratio in the next uh, video. With that, thank you very much and I hope to see you again next time.